Aloha, and thank you for joining us today uh, for this Hawaii Pacific Health webinar focused on the myths and evidence of cervical, uh, sorry, of cancer prevention. Uh, my name is Dr. Jeff Colleen, and I'm here to facilitate today's conversation. Uh, the topics for today uh, that we hope to cover, it will include cancer prevention uh, as a general um, service within a comprehensive cancer program, as well as more specific topics such as smoking and cancer prevention, uh, genetics and cancer risk, uh, and diet and nutrition for cancer prevention. Uh, before we get started, a uh, few items that I would like to mention. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded. Uh, after the event is complete, we'd like the registered participants, uh, they will receive a copy of the recording, and the event will also be available to view on our social media channels and our website. Uh, for those joining us live tonight, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer as many of these questions as we can during the Q&A portion of the event. Uh, before we get started, we'd like you to just answer a, a very quick survey, and the reason we do this is that we want to be able to um, demonstrate what we may learn tonight. So you're going to see a quick survey at six questions. Uh, your participation in this will really help us both with future programming and to see how well we present our information tonight. So we're going to pause for just about two minutes while you do this quick survey on the screen, and then we'll be right back to continue on with the program. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. That, that'll be very helpful, and we'll see how we do at the end of the, the webinar. Um, so thank you for participating. Um, I'd like to begin today's program with some more general information related to cancer prevention and our comprehensive cancer program at Hawaii Pacific Health uh, before we get into the kind of specific topics. Um, what you see on the screen here is just a general graph. And the reason I did this is this is data that was generated out of our cancer program at Hawaii Pacific Health over the last five years. And the reason I put this here was just to show kind of the scope of, of cancer in the Hawaii population. This is broken down by age ranges. And you can see pro probably not too unexpectedly that the highest age range for a cancer diagnosis and treatment is the 60 to 69 age range. But you can see that it does involve all age ranges from children and adolescents um, all the way through elderly individuals. So there's a very broad um, spectrum of patients that are um, faced with a cancer diagnosis. Um, this um, graph or pie graph I did to show the spectrum of cancer by site. Um, I know the print is small at the bottom. Um, you don't really need to look at that, but what each slice of this pie represents is a site of cancer diagnosis. That largest dark blue slice of the pie is breast cancer, which is our most commonly diagnosed and treated cancer, but all of these other slices represent other sites. And even within each one of these slices of the pie, there are actually many, many different types of cancer. Um, for example, the slice that represents lung cancer doesn't mean that all lung cancers are the same. Many are different, and you could, you could argue that every one is different. So these couple of slides I just put in here, just to emphasize before we begin, that that cancer is a, a multitude of diseases. So how we have to approach that has to be in a very um, comprehensive fashion. Uh, this graph shows where we as a cancer program, um, how we address this. And what you can see is that um, although most of the time we talk about things that towards the middle of this graph, things like diagnosis, treatment, um, that's where we talk a lot about newer techniques and new technologies and maybe new drugs that come onto the market. But a real comprehensive cancer program has to address issues that come up all across this spectrum. Um, and you notice at the very beginning of that is prevention and screening. And so that's our topic tonight. Um, while many of the, the talks we get and a lot of the questions we get from patients are related to those you know, newer techniques of surgery or chemotherapy, um, prevention and screening is crucial to a comprehensive cancer program. And although this is sometimes some of the more difficult topics to, 
to talk about because they're so broad. Um, we really wanted to bring this to you tonight and do our best to talk about the prevention side. Now, naturally, um, screening comes into the conversation when we talk about cancer prevention. So there will be times when we kind of drift into prevention type techniques and screening techniques. And we might talk a little bit about the difference, uh, but you might hear both of those terms um, mentioned. What this really all comes down to is a, is a very basic question that I think everyone um, has, which is what causes cancer? Well, cancer is the result of, a, of multiple complex molecular alterations in the cells of the body. Uh, every cancer has a unique set of alterations. In other words, as I mentioned earlier with those graphs, uh, no two cancers are exactly the like. Uh, they all have different um, differences at the molecular level. But then the, that leads to the next question is, is, well, what causes the cells to actually change into cancer cells? Um, that's a, a big question and a question that we've been trying to answer for many years. And in some cancers, we've gotten very close. And in some cancers, we're still struggling. And in some, we're partway there to knowing what makes this happen. We do know some specific things. For example, there are some cancers that are very specifically related to infectious agents. The most common one that we, you probably heard about is human papillomavirus. We, while the virus does not cause cancer itself, it is a necessary factor in the causation of several cancers, in particular cervical cancer in women and head and neck cancer in both men and women where HPV is the cause of a significant subset of cancers. But also some other infectious organisms such as Helicobacter and its relationship with stomach cancer hepatitis viruses in relation to liver cancer. So in some cases, we, we know precisely what causes them and so that we can then undertake prevention strategies to try to prevent them, such as HPV vaccination. We, all, we also know that there are other things such as lifestyle, environmental factors, and genetic factors that clearly have a relationship with cancer development but it's a challenge to know exactly what needs to be done to prevent those. And so that's kind of the, some of the topics that we hope to start to talk about tonight. Um, well, what are the types of cancer prevention? Uh, we, we, we often think of it as, as two different processes. There is one that we call primary prevention. That's when we eliminate the cause that leads to the cancer. Uh, now it's estimated that about 40 to 40, 45% of all cancers affecting humans could actually be prevented if we had optimal risk reduction uh, through primary prevention. An example is HPV vaccination, and we can talk about other, other ones such as smoking. Interestingly, and this is a, a very important aspect, is that many of these primary prevention methods can also improve many non-cancer health problems. For example, smoking. Obviously, that's a good, quitting smoking is important for lung cancer, but if you can think of all the other non-cancer health issues that things like health, like smoking and nutrition um, can affect, uh, you can see the importance of it. And then we talk about secondary prevention, and this is more the concept of screening. Uh, this is when we try to stop the process of cancer development before its full effects have manifested themselves. Um, so we're going to focus mainly on the first one, which is primary prevention. And as I said, we may drift a little bit into screening. So with that kind of introduction, um, it's now my pleasure to, to welcome the first of our experts tonight who's going to be joining us, and that is Dr. Samuel Evans. Dr. Evans is one of the state's leading pulmonologists who's been treating patients with lung cancer and other respiratory diseases in Hawaii for over 20 years now. Uh, he is an assistant clinical professor and the division chief of pulmonary medicine at the John A. Burns School of Medicine and the chief of pulmonary medicine at Hawaii Pacific Health. Uh, Dr. Evans will be presenting uh, on smoking and cancer prevention. So thank you for coming, Dr. Evans, and we look forward to what you're going to say tonight. Good evening, everybody. 
Um, it's my pleasure to do a few slides on lung cancer and some of the prevention strategies. As many of you may know or not know, lung cancer is the third most common cancer in the U.S. following breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men. But more people in the U.S. die from lung cancer than any other type of, of cancer, and this is true for both women and men. You can see the rate of new cancers in the, in the U.S. Uh, are highest in the tobacco belt, and of course, smoking is a major risk factor for many cancers, and especially lung cancer, where about 87% of lung cancers uh, patients have a history of, of smoking. Cancer deaths in the United States due to lung and, and bronchogenic cancer also follow the same kind of tobacco belt uh, areas. Um, and then some larger states like Texas and California have pretty high rates of lung cancer death. You can see that Hawaii is doing pretty well compared to other states. Cancer in Hawaii. Of all cases, there were about 7,600 new cases in 2019. That means about 414 new cancer cases per 100,000 population. In that same year, 2,500 people died of cancer, or 127 per 100,000 people here in Hawaii. Hawaii also follows the rest of the nation in terms of the top 10 cancers, breast being number one, prostate being number two, and lung cancer being number three, with 800 new cases diagnosed in 2019. So 800 new cases for every 100,000 people, that's about 40 new lung cancer cases reported. Um, and that same year, 2019, 543 people died of lung cancer, or about 27 per 100,000 people. So not great, but better than some other states. Um, so you can see that lung cancer is our number one cancer ki killer in Hawaii, which matches the other states in our nation. Lung cancer screening. The U.S. Uh, Preventative Task Force Service did a large trial, uh, and we were included in Hawaii maybe a decade ago or a little more, and they screened patients who had a 20-pack year or more smoking history, who are still active smokers or had quit within the last 15 years and were between the ages of 50 and 80. These numbers have changed a little bit over the years, but, but similar, their trial used similar criteria. Unfortunately for Hawaii, we still rank as one of the lower states in the nation screening for lung cancer with CT. So we've got to do a better job. It's a tough one. You know, it takes about 320 CT scans to prevent one lung cancer death. So um, it, it doesn't always, uh, you know, amount to, a, you know, an easy diagnosis. And, and of those 320 people, um, you know, 18 of them will have lung cancer, but they'll die of it. So 320 CTs to prevent one death of can from lung cancer. And testing is not perfect in and of itself. So we've shown that uh, you, sh you probably shouldn't be screening low-risk groups, right? So someone who maybe only smoked for a couple of years or played around in high school um, is probably not going to be a high-risk person for lung cancer. Um, CTs also can create uh, false positives or false, false alarms. This is when uh, you do the CT and you find something. Maybe you find a nodule. And this leads to more testing, maybe a biopsy. And maybe you have a biopsy and you get a complication, such as a collapsed lung. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful on who we select uh, and what we do with the results of these tests. There's also the, the worry for radiation exposure. Uh, and so uh, we try to use low-dose CTs, and our uh, radiologists will actually calculate the lifetime dose of radiation that a patient has acquired. And it costs money. So CT scans about $300 or more. If you meet the screening criteria, insurance will cover it. Um, but when you do this across the nation, it's not a cheap thing to do. But then again, lung cancer is an expensive disease. 
for that, I'm going to give it back uh, over to you, Dr. Killeen. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Evans. So I'm sure we'll have some questions um, in the Q&A portion related to, to lung cancer screening and smoking, but we'd like to move on now. And next we have Mary Hickman. Uh, Mary is a board certified genetic counselor who specializes in inherited cancer predisposition syndromes. Uh, she obtained her master's in genetic counseling at Northwestern University and practiced in Chicago, Illinois before joining us with Hawaii Pacific Health in 2021. So please welcome Mary, who will be presenting um, for a few minutes on genetics and cancer risks. Mary. So ultimately, uh, a common concern that comes up when speaking about genetics or hereditary cancer risk is that unfortunately, cancer is extremely common. About one in three people will develop it in their lifetimes. And it can start to feel like within certain families that many individuals are diagnosed with cancer, and that can make a single individual feel that they are at an extremely high risk, just seeing many close relatives diagnosed with cancer. But ultimately, only about 5 to 10 percent of individuals with cancer have a hereditary predisposition syndrome. A majority, about 65 percent, are sporadic disease. And what sporadic means in this situation is environmental factors, uh, external factors, lifestyle, tobacco use and lung cancer, for example, infection, as we had mentioned, HPV and cervical cancer, and ultimately just the aging process as we get older. About 15 to 25 percent of diagnoses do fall within this familial category, which is a combination of shared genetics and environment within families, maybe shared biology, and it could also account for some inborn genetic causes or risks for cancer that have not yet been discovered or aren't well understood. So as mentioned earlier, cancer is caused by a complex series of uh, mutations in cell damage that result in normal healthy cells becoming cancerous. And this is over the course of lots of external damage, carcinogens, and again, just random chance through the cell cycle as our cells divide. So the image on the left demonstrates a normal healthy cell acquiring that damage over time and becoming cancerous. But the image on the right is an individual who has a uh, hereditary cancer condition. So this means that they are already born with a genetic mutation in every single cell of their body that is predisposing a higher risk for that cell to become cancerous through continued damage. So individuals with a genetic syndrome do not have active cancer within their bodies. It means that they are already born with some of this cell damage. So how do we identify families who are at risk for these inherited cancer conditions or for these genetic mutations? Typical patterns that we might expect to see are younger than typical age of onset for certain cancers. We already saw that curve of the varied ages that we can see cancer uh, age of onset. And typically that falls uh, over the age of 50 or 60. But especially if we're seeing younger onset cancers for things like breast or colorectal cancer, that can be a concerning flag. Rare forms of cancer or tumors can also be suggestive of an inherited syndrome. Ovarian cancer is a good example of this, where even though only about 5 to 10 percent of cancers have a hereditary cause, if we parse that out individually based on a specific site, about 20 to 25 percent of individuals who have ovarian cancer are found to have a hereditary cause. Another sign might be multiple primary diagnoses in a single individual. So if over their life, let's say a woman is diagnosed with both breast and ovarian cancer, or maybe a man is diagnosed with colorectal and prostate cancer, these can be suggestive of underlying syndromes. Finally, and this is where it gets a little bit trickier, is whether or not there's multiple close relatives diagnosed with cancer. And usually we're looking for either the same type of cancer or interrelated diagnoses. And close relatives refers to our parents, our siblings, children, aunties and uncles, grandparents, and cousins. So usually about second to third degree relatives. This chart here is essentially just an example of the many different genes that when damaged can increase the baseline risk for cancer in an individual. Many are aware, I think, of the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are the first two listed here. But the reason I show this is to demonstrate that a single genetic mutation or a single inherited cancer condition can increase the risk for multiple forms of cancer. It isn't necessarily cancer globally, because all cancer diagnoses are quite unique and not the same disease, but a mutation in a single gene might increase the risk for cancer across different systems, 
which might necessitate screening in different body systems. Let's say if a family member had breast cancer, then we detect a genetic mutation, it might warrant screening for pancreatic cancer. Finally, this is just an example of a family pedigree. This is a pretty routine image that I take in my consults where we go through and map out the family tree and indicate ages, whether or not you know, family members have passed away and whether or not they've been diagnosed with cancer. The reason I show this is because this is an example of a healthy 40 year old woman who does have a family history of breast cancer. And based on this history, she would qualify for genetic testing. Some individuals feel that they would not want to know their genetic results in a predictive fashion, and so it is an individualized choice. But one of the best predictors of our risk for cancer and for our health is family history. So even in the absence of any genetic testing for this family, or if this individual does get a genetic test and it comes back negative or non-diagnostic, we would still want to manage them based on this family history. So this is a woman who might qualify for additional breast screening in the form of interval screening every six months with mammogram and MRI based on family history alone and not due to any genomic differences. Okay, thanks, Mary. Um, we already have some questions that I'm sure are going to be directed your way for the Q&A um, portion of the program. But for our final presentation, formal presentation, uh, I'm going to welcome Dr. Jamie Fakui. Uh, Dr. Fakui is an associate professor at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center and a breast oncologist for Hawaii Pacific Health. Uh, her interests are in breast cancer clinical and translational research, developing clinical trials protocols, and providing cancer care to residents of Hawaii. Dr. Fukui will be talking about diet and nutrition for cancer prevention. Uh, thank you for being with us, Dr. Fukui. Thank you so much. So um, I have kind of structured this talk to go over really common topics that come up for my uh, breast cancer survivors when I see them in clinic. Um, so I'll, I'll go through these rather quickly. Um, and really, the, something that comes up all the time is, do I need to change my diet? Um, probably, most of us don't get enough fruits and vegetables, but one of the questions come up, do I need to eat organic? Um, organic foods may contain higher levels of what we call phytonutrients. Um, they're basically biologically active components that are found in plants and foods. And they, what they do is they fight against cancer. They can interrupt cancer development. So it is important to have that. Now, whether or not, organic, it's, it's really comes, um, those phytonutrients come from vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, and they should be part of any diet. Um, and so it's not necessarily important to have them grown organically or not. Another common question that comes up, what about um, GMO or genetically modified organisms or foods? Um, these are um, more and more common in our foods. Um, they're basically bioengineered or modified. Genes are added to these plants or organisms for purposes um, to increase a plant's resistance to insects or to spoilage. Um, and sometimes they can improve flavor and nutrient content. Um, there is no evidence at this time that GMOs increases someone's risk of cancer, but we still are learning more and studies are underway to determine whether or not there is long-term um, problems with these dietary intakes. Right now, we consider GMOs are generally recognized as safe for consumption. Another question that comes up, okay, we need to eat fruits and vegetables, but what kind? Fresh, canned, frozen, is there a difference? Um, fresh is referring to um, produce that is picked, shipped, and then within a short period of time is used. And that's usually regionally available, so locally, so at the farmer's markets and things. Canned um, are picked and preserved, and they usually need to have salt or sugar as a preservative, and they're usually stable for a while, and they're internationally available. When we refer to frozen, we're really talking about things that have been picked, cleaned, and immediately frozen. And so that freezing locks in the nutritional profile, and that can be, of course, available internationally. And so uh, what we recommend actually is to choose fresh and frozen um, produce when available, because with canned produce, um, there's, there can sometimes be a high salt or sugar content. 
Another common question is, should I cut out sugar from my diet? We know that sugar is not good for cancer cells. Well, all cells have sugar or carbohydrates, but there are different kinds. Cancer cells may utilize sugar a little bit more rapidly or differently than normal cells. Um, and carbohydrates are found in many foods. There are two main kinds, complex carbohydrates, such as whole foods, uh, whole fruits, vegetables and grains, they contain natural sugars. So when uh, my diabetic patients ask, you know, should I just cut out everything? No, absolutely not. Um, you can have the complex carbohydrates. They're very important to have some natural sugars and they contribute to beneficial nutrition such as fiber, micronutrients, and these phytonutrients I was talking about before. They help to fight against cancer. The refined carbohydrates, those are the sweets and treats. They, and I know the holidays are here, so it's a little bit challenging, but they do contain an added processed sugar and they're generally, they don't offer any nutritional benefit. So um, they also contribute to increased weight, inflammation, which we know can predispose people to developing cancer and increasing the risk of cancer progression. So if you're gonna choose some type of sugar, please choose the complex carbohydrates instead of the refined. Another common thing that comes up, I heard about this alkaline water or alkaline diet. This is what um, you know, we should do to help with cancer growth. No, um, our body, um, we know that it, acidic environments can help cancer cells grow. So the thought is that alkaline diet or alkaline water can help to um, decrease an acidic environment. Our acid-base balance in our body is regulated by our kidneys. So the pH of our blood and our body does really, it doesn't change no matter what you eat. So if you have acidic food or if you have alkaline foods or beverages, they do not alter that pH. So save your money. You do not need to purchase alkaline foods or beverages. They do not have an impact on, micro, on the microenvironment of cancer cells. If you like the taste of it, that's a different story. Finally, a topic that often comes up is we know that um, being overweight or obese is unhealthy, but especially we know that certain obesity, so central obesity in the abdomen mainly, is linked to increased risk of certain types of cancers. There are 13 cancers that we know of that are associated with being overweight or obese. Meningiomas, thyroid, breast, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, multiple myeloma, which is a rare blood disease, uh, blood cancer, kidneys, the uterus and ovaries, the liver, gallbladder, upper stomach, pancreas, and colon. And so about 40% of all cancers in the US are associated with being overweight or obese. And so we know that that is an ongoing problem in the US especially, and that these obesity related cancers have been increasing. So there is something we can do about this. Our lifestyle is so important. We can't change our genes, what we're born with, but we can change our lifestyle. So physical activity and weight management are crucial to living a healthy life and having a healthy body weight and reducing our risk of cancer. So it's important to have aerobic activities. This may help with reducing your weight overall, but also with improving lung capacity and breathing. There also is an important um, weight resistance training, which actually can help with bone density, making sure that stays strong. And then what's recommended is really to limit any sedentary behavior, like sitting, lying down, watching TV. I know some people decide to do their activities while they're watching TV, so they're not just sitting. Um, and what's recommended is to do about 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity. So that's a, about 30 minutes or so of physical activity per, uh, per day, or 150 to 300 minutes per week, or 75 to 150 minutes of rigorous intense activity. Another common thing that comes up, and I believe this is my last slide, is about nutrition supplements. Um, it's a huge industry, but nutrition um, supplements have not been regulated the same way that the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration um, uh, does with their medications and um, foods. So they can often claim things that aren't necessarily true. Um, antioxidant supplements appear to offer no protection from cancer development. And what we generally say is it's much better to get all of our nutrients um, from our natural foods because the synergistic effect of having those nutrients in our foods work better together than just having an isolated supplement or an extract in a supplemental form. 
We also know that mega doses of these supplements can actually increase someone's risk of certain types of cancers. For instance, beta carotin, which is an, um, a vitamin A precursor, increases the risk of lung cancer for smokers. Calcium in can prostate cancer survivors, um, having too much of that is, an, is associated with an increased risk of mortality. Folic acid is a little bit of um, twofold. It appears to reduce the risk of cancer development, but it also is linked to cancer progression if somebody has cancer already formed in their body. So taking supplements is not benign. It has um, some things can, that can be very active in the body. So please obtain these compounds from whole foods, meaning from fruits, vegetables, grains versus supplements. That's the most beneficial. Now, I will say that sometimes our doctors will check our vitamin levels. If a vitamin level is low, that is an indication to take a supplement. So for instance, vitamin D, because we often don't get enough in our diet. But for these all other extra supplements, it's not um, probably healthy for us to do that. In general, or for summary, to summarize, um, we have to achieve and maintain a healthy weight throughout our life. That's so important for our health. To adapt a physical active lifestyle is also very important. To choose a healthy diet with an emphasis on plant-based foods and avoid alcohol, which I didn't touch too much on. But if you are gonna drink alcohol, just limit the consumption. It's okay to have, for men, up to two drinks a day, for women, up to one drink a day. But of course, less is better. And I do wanna actually mention um, that there is ongoing trials right now looking um, at body composition to measure your health and understanding metabolic risk factors and its relation to cancer at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center um, through a program called Shape Up for not only kids and adults, it's looking at body composition and some of the other risk factors that could be related to cancer development. There's also a healthy diet and lifestyle study that is open right now at the Cancer Center. It's looking at diet habits and physical activity in people and seeing how the fat in the body can change and result in reducing someone's risk of cancer development. There's also ongoing screening trials available. Um, so if you're interested in participating, um, please contact uh, the University of Hawaii Cancer Center. There are constant um, screening trials going on as well in breast cancer and other cancers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Fukui. Um, so we still have all around 20 to 25 minutes for our Q&A session. We do have um, some questions that have come in uh, directly. Some were submitted uh, at the time of registration, but we have some that were submitted here during our program tonight. So um, I'm just going to kind of pick from these and and go back and forth between uh, all of our guests and um, see if we can answer as many of these as possible. Now, we do have a, a fair amount of time. So our panel members, please don't feel rushed to give an answer if you, if you want to take a few minutes to really get the details so that we can have our registrants get a clear answer um, by all means. Um, we want to make sure that we get as much information as we can. Um, so I'm going to just going to jump in here with a question that was that was given, and it, it goes along with maybe a second question. This is probably for Dr. Evans. Uh, the question is, what are the USPSTF criteria for low dose CT screening um, that will be in that will be covered by insurance? Yeah. So currently, the um, the criteria are you need to be between the age of 50 and 80. Uh, you need to have at least a 20-pack year or more smoking history. And you need to either be an active smoker or one who has quit within the last 15 years. So if you quit 25 years ago, insurance is not going to cover that screening CT. Okay, thanks, Dr. Evans. And this is kind of a related question that came in. Um, if a, if a low-dose lung screening test shows a nodule, um, is it always cancer, and what kind of additional testing or follow-up might I expect? That's a great question, and yeah, nodules are tricky. Nodules can be a scar. Nodules can be an infection, such as TB or fungus. Um, nodules may be a benign inflammation. So no, it's not always a lung cancer. If I can get approval, sometimes I'll try to get more information about that nodule with a PET scan. 
And a PET scan will tell me what is the metabolic activity of that nodule. If it's hypermetabolic or lights up bright on the PET scan, I'm going to be more concerned that it could be a tumor. Okay, thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, this question that, that came in um, sounds like it should probably be for Mary. It's, um, I'm going to kind of summarize it. Um, my, my family has a very strong history of cancer, including pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, and breast cancer. And I was told that I was very high risk, and it was recommended that I have BRCA gene testing. Um, however, I'm not sure how easy that is to, to have in Hawaii. Is it something that I can get if I ask my doctor? This is a great question. I think something a lot of people struggle with is to know the pipeline to get appropriate genetic testing. First and foremost, if you have a family history, speak with your primary care provider and they can uh, navigate or refer you to an appropriate provider to do that consultation and determine the most appropriate genetic testing. There isn't just a single one size fits all genetic test and it's gonna be tailored based on your family history. So your primary care can evaluate for that, make sure that you qualify and have you referred to genetics. But absolutely in this case, it's something that you would qualify for. Um, I also just wanna address another question that was in the chat because it's a bit similar in that someone who's already had genetic testing and whether or not that's something they would need to circle back for. And um, genetic testing has changed over the years. 2013 was a mile marker a year where if you had BRCA1 and BRCA2 only testing prior to that, we now know of dozens of other genetic risk factors for breast cancer and other forms of cancer. So insurance will cover testing um, for these larger panels of many other genes. Okay, thanks, Mary. Maybe we'll go to, to one that maybe you could comment on and then Dr. Evans might as well that came in that says, are there genetic markers for lung cancer or is lung cancer mostly caused by environmental factors such as smoking? This is one of those tricky ones where the majority of individuals who um, are diagnosed with lung cancer do not have identifiable genetic risk factors. Most of these inherited syndromes don't overlap with lung cancer. There is a gene EGFR that is tested that is a risk factor for lung cancer. But I think that Dr. Evans can speak more to how that's used actually clinically and within screening. Yeah, so family history is important. And I do see a lot of patients with lung cancer who have parents or a sibling who have had a lung cancer. So I do ask about the family history. Smoking history is the most important risk factor. Like I said, 87% or more of lung cancers are associated with a smoking history. Um, as far as screening for lung cancer with molecular studies, we don't usually do that because it's expensive. Um, but once we have established a diagnosis of a lung cancer, depending on the stage, we may send a panel to see can we identify the mutation that's driving the, the cancer. And you mentioned EGFR, that's only one of them. We There's probably 20 or more that have been identified now and uh, we target them with treatment in the appropriate patient. Okay, thank you both. Um, here's a question for Dr. Fakui. Um, how, how do I balance my nutrition to prevent cancer if I have diabetes? Yeah, that comes up a lot. Um, and I think one of the chats kind of asking similar things, fruits are okay to eat. Yes, there's some that have higher sugar content. So you wanna steer clear of having too many of those, orange juice being one of, or oranges being one of them, um, and some of those fruits. Um, and, but for honey, for instance, that is a great um, low glycemic index type of um, sugar. And um, maple syrup, probably not so much, but I would actually um, make sure you check in with your primary care doctor. There might be tables to actually utilize for glycemic index to actually figure out which fruits are probably better, not gonna fluctuate the sugar levels in your body. Um, so that's one thing. And I will address one of the other questions if you don't mind in the chat. Um, so there was some question about, you know, having these extracts, for instance, from a pomegranate juice instead to do a powder. And in general, what I tell people, when it goes through an extraction process, removing maybe some other components that naturally occur in the actual plant. So it's always better to have it in its natural form. If you're going to have celery, have celery the way it's made. Um, you know, it's okay to have celery juice, for instance, or pomegranate juice, but there's a lot of other additional things that go along with those um, fiber, for instance, that are just as important. So I think if you can try to eat the actual raw plant as much as possible. 
Okay, thanks, Dr. Fukui. And I think we'll stick with you with a little different um, angle. And this, this gets to what I said earlier about how prevention and screening often are kind of a continuum. This question is, if I have a higher risk of breast cancer, uh, how is the screening protocol or the screening recommendations modified? So um, Mary kind of touched on this. So if there's a higher risk of developing breast cancer, either because of genetics or family history, um, then there is a, a way to screen beyond annual mammograms. And what we recommend for the general population is at age 40 to have a screening mammogram. But above that, um, it would be every six months alternating between a mammogram and MRI. I do think that it's important to be plugged into a high-risk clinic. Um, they're available here on island. We have one as well at Kapiolani. And that um, actually is a comprehensive clinic that is looking not only at genetics and lifestyle and family history, but overall how to best optimize your health, knowing that there's an increased risk of developing breast cancer. Okay, thanks, Dr. Fukui. Uh, here's a question that was uh, submitted um, earlier at the time of registration. Uh, is it possible to screen for endometrial cancer if you have family history? And I'm actually going to jump in and take that one because I, I wanted to get talk about a couple things. It's, it's a very large part of my practice in breast and GYN pathology. Um, endometrial cancer is one of the most common cancers in women. Um, and, and one thing that needs to really be understood is that a pap smear is not a screening test for endometrial cancer. Uh, a pap smear is only a screening test for cervical cancer, and in particular, a certain type of cervical cancer called squamous cell carcinoma. So some, some people are, are mistaken that if they have a negative pap smear, that that means they've been screened for cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, and ovarian cancer even, and that's just not the case. Uh, the pap smear has never been shown to be an adequate screening test for anything other than cervical cancer. So that does get to, is there, is there a test for endometrial cancer screening? And that's been attempted. Um, the only time that's really put in use now is if a patient has been identified with a specific, very high risk um, situation for endometrial cancer, such as Lynch syndrome, which is an inherited disease that I'm sure Mary could tell us a, a lot about. But those patients are at a very high risk of endometrial cancer. And so although there aren't specific guidelines on to, how to screen for that, there is at least some agreement that they should probably, those patients should undergo some sort of more active screening, such as an endometrial biopsy or a transvaginal ultrasound on a yearly basis just to try to detect cancers early. But for the most part, endometrial cancer is, is diagnosed because of symptoms such as bleeding. Um, and so there really is, at this point, we don't have a great endometrial cancer screening test. Uh, Mary, do you have anything to add about Lynch syndrome and maybe any other um, interventions that, that might be out there? Yeah, I think you touched on really the approaches for screening that we have with transvaginal ultrasound and biopsy. Unfortunately, with Lynch syndrome, um, there's a number of different specific genes that can cause this condition. Some are more high risk than others. And one of the standards of care really is considering hysterectomy to prophylactically or preventatively remove that risk for cancer. And that's typically done after childbearing age, usually anywhere from age 40 to 50. So when we're thinking about the spectrum of preventative care, especially for someone who has a genetic syndrome, this can be early detection and screening, but the other end of this really is potentially a surgical approach. Okay, thanks, Mary. I'm gonna stick with Mary, because this question came in and this is actually something I've, I'd like to hear the answer to, I don't know, and I think it's a great question. Um, can at-home genetic tests such as 23andMe or Ancestry tell me about my risk for cancer? And this is a very common question that comes up in clinic. Um, the short answer is no. Uh, not all genetic tests are the same, especially these, we call them direct-to-consumer or at-home genetic tests. 23andMe does advertise a health history um, part of their test or screening that does include analysis of the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. As I've already touched on, there are dozens of other genes that can cause cancer risk, so this is not a complete test. 
Also, many of these panels that do direct to consumer testing are only looking at specific uh, variants, or if we think of them as only single spelling differences within an entire book of information, usually that are only common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. When we think about how applicable that is to our community in Hawaii, a normal or negative test on 23andMe is not going to be applicable to um, their health risk, and certainly I would not rule out a BRCA mutation based on that. Okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, let's see, we've got a lot of stuff coming in. There are some questions that kind of um, go a little bit into more of the treatment, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to address at least a few of those. Um, this one is for Dr. Evans. Um, how, how do you actually establish that someone has a diagnosis of lung cancer? Maybe this is brought in in relation to, well, low-dose low lung screening showed a nodule, but, but now what? How do we find out if that's cancer or not? And maybe I could add on to that, um, are there any other options for treating lung cancer other than having surgery? Yeah, so it, it, you have to have a thoughtful approach to when you detect a nodule. Like I mentioned, uh, if I can get a PET scan, it, it helps me with uh, risk stratification of how worried I am about it. If it does light up bright on the PET scan, I'm also using that PET scan to, to ask, is it anywhere else? So sometimes we'll spread to the lymph nodes, say in the armpit or in the neck, and that changes the way I'm going to approach it. So if I can uh, establish the diagnosis by the least invasive manner, that's what I'll order. I'll ask the radiologist, can you do an ultrasound needle aspirate of that lymph node in the neck? rather than put the patient under general anesthesia and do an invasive procedure. Um, but yes, for some patients, if it's just an isolated nodule, the options are usually a bronchoscopy, which is a painless procedure where the patient's put asleep and we put a camera in the mouth and go uh, navigate in the, in the lung up to the nodule and take a piece of it. The other way to do it is if the nodule is up against the chest wall is to have a uh, Radiologist put some numbing medicine between the ribs and put a, a fine needle into the nodule and take a piece that way. That doesn't require general anesthesia. So there's different approaches depending on where the thing is located and whether or not there's evidence of spread. Okay, thanks, Dr. Evans. Um, okay, we're going to keep jumping and we're going to we're going to um, put Dr. Fukui on the spot. So this just came in. Do caffeine and tofu affect breast cancer? If so, how much should be ingested? Great, this comes up a lot, especially since most of the breast cancers are hormone-driven or hormone-positive breast cancers, about 75%. So most people think, you know, does tofu affect that? Um, there was a large study, several large studies that looked at this. Um, eating tofu does not increase a, a woman's risk of getting breast cancer recurrence. In fact, in some studies, if people have been raised on tofu and they continue or soy products and they continue to eat that after breast cancer diagnosis, that might even be beneficial. Um, but so what I tell my patients is if you were always eating tofu or soy products, it's perfectly safe and healthy to continue doing that. And if somebody wanted to start eating it, we do not think it increases a woman's risk of recurrence. As far as caffeine in general, um, there's mixed data as far as the health benefits of caffeine um, for breast cancer. Um, there hasn't been anything to show that it's dangerous to drink caffeine beverages. Um, but of course, it goes along with a lot of uh, other kinds of additives. I would say in general, if someone's going to have caffeine, probably more in the teas, green tea is actually beneficial for a number of reasons. So get your caffeine that way if possible. Okay, thank you. So I think this is an important question here. And I, I, um, I think it's going to be Mary that's going to um, maybe start out talking about it. Um, the question is, you discussed what women can do if they have a family cancer history. Obviously, we talked about breast cancer, endometrial cancer, but what about men? Mary, maybe you could talk a little bit about the various um, hereditary or high-risk um, genetic cancer syndromes, in particular, those that affect cancers more common to men, and what, what those patients might be able to do about that. 
Of course. And I think it's unfortunate that uh, oftentimes some of these cancers that affect women more heavily do dominate the conversation as we discuss hereditary risks for cancer, especially because the BRCA genes are most well known and prominent and affect breast and ovarian cancer in women. But when we think about risk for men, many of these syndromes impact organ systems that are either unique to biological men or that every individual has. So we had talked about Lynch syndrome as an example that I'll use, that in addition to things like uterine cancer, also astronomically increases the risk for colorectal cancer, anywhere from 40 to up to 70%, depending on the gene. And that can affect both men and women, where we might recommend colorectal screening through colonoscopies as early as 20 to 25. So in terms of what this means for men, both men and women are at equal risk of inheriting these genetic mutations. And we need to take a look at what I call an organ inventory and in reviewing what organ systems an individual has, what organ systems are affected by a specific gene mutation, and how we can create management surrounding that. Whether it's starting prostate exams uh, earlier, whether it's increasing the frequency of colonoscopies rather than every 10 years, to annually or every five years, depending on the risk. So both men and women have an equal risk of inheriting these genetic mutations. It's not purely inherited from mom's side of the family or from dad's side of the family. It just affects us each a little bit differently depending on the organs that we have. Okay, Th thanks, Mary. Um, here's a question that came in, I think, for Dr. Evans. Uh, I know someone who had lung cancer but had never smoked. Are there other risk factors besides smoking uh, for any types of lung cancer? Yeah, so I, I do see patients uh, without a smoking history that will get a lung cancer. And um, the most common scenario is it, it's a woman who was exposed to her spouse's secondhand smoke. And um, usually they'll be older and the husband has long since passed away from all their smoking related diseases and the woman's you know in her 80s or 90s and she's got a lung cancer but sometimes i'll see some people who have no uh no exposure at all um an important one in hawaii and i think i saw this in the q a was uh shipyard workers so are those who worked in the military or worked on the ships uh, they were insulate insulating the piping with asbestos and so those exposed to asbestos are at a much higher risk for lung cancer, especially if they smoke, um, but also if they don't. And um, some other more rare substances like beryllium um, that, that sometimes can cause an increased risk of lung cancer, but we don't see that as often. Okay, thank you, Dr. Evans. We've got a couple minutes left, I think. We'll try to get in a couple more questions. Um, maybe, maybe Mary um, could talk about this and maybe Dr. Fukui, uh, and I think they're, maybe I should because I think they're referring to the graph that I put up there, but I'll have, I'll have our panelists take a crack at this. Uh, why is the percentage of cancer high, highest for that age 60 to 79 when the percentages seem lower in the ages below um, and in the ages higher than that, that range? I think there's a lot of different sort of approaches to the answer for this from a hereditary genetic standpoint. Um, as I had showed before that cancer, if we think about just acquired genomic mutations or acquired damage within our cells, if we think of that as a, a long process, through the aging process, it takes time for us to acquire that damage, and usually cancers onset much later in age. Um, that's why seeing such a young age of diagnosis of certain cancers is concerning for an inborn hereditary risk factor because that's more atypical. So it's really part of that, just the aging process and the exposures that we have that accumulate over time. I know there's more nuanced approaches to that question too. Any comments about that, Dr. Fukui? Yeah, maybe why it's peaking at that um, time frame is because one of the most common cancers in women specifically is breast cancer. And we know the average age of uh, diagnosis for breast cancer is 62. So that falls within that range. So if we're thinking sheer for, for numbers perspective, that's a highly represented um, group of cancers in that age range. Yeah, and I think the thing that I would add to that too is that one of the reasons that where those those age ranges are detected. Of course, it's what Mary said is that 
over time, the cells age and may not be as good at repairing damage um, as they were younger because there's always damage going on, but the, the body repairs that. Um, the other thing is we, we tend to screen more for cancers in, in certain age ranges. And usually after a certain age range, we tend to not screen for the cancers anymore. And so part of that lower incidence, especially in the, the, um, the elderly higher age, age ranges is that we are no longer screening for the cancers. And one, of, and one reason we don't is because that puts you at risk to detect very small, very what we call indolent or slow growing cancers that would not have an impact on that patient's life or quality of life. And so we kind of stop looking for them. Um, and so I think if we kept screening, um, no matter what the age, I think probably that incidence of cancer in the older age groups would probably go up. Um, so we've got, maybe we'll try to sneak in at least one more question. Let's see. Um, here's one, I, I think Dr. Fukui is gonna have to try to answer this and I, I better know the answer to this too because I, I probably consume this. Have studies con confirmed that consuming diet sodas increase cancer risk? If yes, is there a threshold to be aware of? Yeah, great question. You know, it's always hard to find like a causation for cancer, but um, we do know that it, it, it is unhealthy and it contributes to a lot of the obesity epidemic. Um, so I don't know if there's a threshold. I'm not aware of a direct causality from drinking or consuming diet sodas, increasing the risk, but inadvertently it does increase obesity, inflammation, and those things which we know are risk factors for cancer. So I, I think it is important to limit the consumption of that, but I do not know what the threshold is at this time. And I'm sure there are not gonna be any large studies doing that anytime soon. No, and um, but like everything else, I guess, just in moderation. Um, and I think we're just about out of, but out of time, but before we get to kind of my closing remarks, I, I guess one thing that I wanted to, to emphasize to the audience is how much the topic of cancer prevention crosses over into just healthy lifestyle. Um, it is, if you follow, you know, some of the suggestions that our, our panelists have brought up um, and that we sometimes see in the media or paper about um, good nutrition, um, good whole foods, not supplements, exercise, weight control. Um, it is not just cancer prevention that you're going to be de working on. You're actually going to be preventing a lot of medical issues um, that are tied to the same things. Cancer is tied to many of the risk factors for many other health problems in our society. So I, I think you can get an awful lot of, if you want to say bang for the buck with a lot of these prevention strategies, not just in cancer prevention. Uh, so I think we would encourage you for that. So with that, I think I'd like to very much thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Evans, Dr. Fakui, Mary for, for joining us, um, providing their insights for our viewers and for everyone watching. Uh, we hope that you found this program informative and useful in your efforts to prevent cancer. Uh, and as you've heard throughout this program, Hawaii Pacific Health does offer a comprehensive service related to, to cancer treatment, and that includes cancer prevention and screening ideas um, to support the medical needs of you and your family. And this can range from virtual care via video or phone uh, to in-person visits, uh, no matter what fits your situation the best, we're here to keep you help healthier. Um, if you have any questions regarding our services or today's webinar, please visit hawaiipacifichealth.org. Um, but, and before you sign off, we'd really appreciate you taking a minute to answer what we call a post test. What this will be is basically the six same questions that you answered at the beginning of the talk. Um, you'll answer them again, and that can give us a really good idea about how we've done um, what we need to work on for future webinars and be able to demonstrate what impact we've had on you and your family's health. So thank you again for joining us today. You can use that um, code there to access that those questions 
and we hope that you stay safe and healthy. Uh, good night.